Um, so, as uh, Michael said, my name is uh, Vinoba Vinagamuthi, but the only person who calls me Vinoba is my mother, and only when she's pissed at me. So, Vino will do. Um, I work at the BBC, as I said, and my collaborator in this paper was uh, Maxine Glancy. This project is actually a collaboration between BBC R&D and IRT, who is on the right there. I've kind of uh, pushed them aside. Uh, Christoph Ziegler, who is with me here, is also a co-author. Uh, for those of you in the crowd who don't know about the BBC's uh, research and development, unit, we essentially look at uh, technologies to future-proof the BBC. And IRT does the same for the public broadcasters in Germany. Um, and uh, this problem space is essentially about putting augments using AR technologies for television. It is not a new uh, problem space. Um, it, it's been around for quite, the idea has been around for quite a while. But um, where we differ, is, I suppose, is that technology has moved on to allow the video frame-accurate synchronization between a television and a connected device in your home network. So our general problem space has been, um, you know, has a public broadcaster, how do we let our audiences watch, listen, and uh, experience everything that we make uh, anytime, anywhere, and, um, at, you know, any, in any way that they want. And uh, so we have a background of work that has been going along where we are looking at a wide range of platforms and devices because we have to serve pretty much everyone with whatever devices they might have. Uh, we like to create well-designed, accessible user uh, experiences, and we tend to select technologies that might uh, maximize the services in a sort of cost-effective way. Uh, we also like to work in partnership with others, and so IRT is a very good um, collaborator of ours for a lot of projects. And we tend to do, uh, in addition to the sort of paper writing and uh, distributing our uh, findings across academic conferences, we tend to do a lot of uh, standards and specification work. Uh, the DBB project, for instance, is one for the digital video broadcasting uh, projects, and uh, we have worked with industry partners to ensure that there's a way for televisions to talk to devices on a home network through the companion screens and screen specification. This means that any um, TV general that generally in the UK that has the Freeview Play pattern on it has the potential to have a profile of HVB TV 2.0, which will allow synchronization between a connected TV and uh, devices. Um, and so as part of uh, an EU project uh, called To Immerse, we wanted to see how far we can push the uh, protocols. So um, before I go on to the uh, actual thing that we did, uh, here's a video that uh, shows us having two video sources on two separate devices. And um, in a few minutes, you'll have a split screen where you'll see that the top left-hand side shows the sort of uh, timing uh, information there, and it's pretty close. It's frame accurate. Um, I have decided to spare you the inconvenience of listening to the beeps that goes with this calibration video, but um, it's very exciting stuff. We had a standing ovation in the office and everything. Um, it's also a video I've shown over and over again for the last two years. Um, anyway. So in this particular project, our objectives was to see, well, how can we use the AR technologies to deliver something quite uh, important to the BBC access services, or sign language interpretation for telev our television programs. Now, we are the R&D component, so this is not going to be a service for the BBC. That is not at all what I'm saying. But we wanted to see if this was a potential thing that we could do. Um, so it's essentially a, you know, passive, non-interactive experience uh, where you sit on uh, our couch watching a television program and you have an optical head-mounted display, in this case a HoloLens, not for any special uh, kind of purpose. We just, the HoloLens was the first HMD we had and IRT had a uh, HoloLens as well, so it seemed like a good device to use. Our research questions were, can AR be used to augment TV programs using DBBCSS? Uh, what should AR sign language interpreters look like? I mean, we, the, the, the idea is there, but no one has really designed a sign language interpreter outside the television. Um, and what do users with hearing impairments, people who would be our target demographic, what do they think of our AR sign language interpreters? Uh, figure out the limits and potential. So this image hopefully gives an idea of uh, what we were working with. Uh, the top column shows the sign language interpretation um, sort of envision, which is essentially the traditional way that sign language interpreters are uh, shown to the UK audiences. The bottom right um, on the far end has the uh, German uh, version. 
uh, we conducted this project equal in a sort of balanced way between the UK and Germany. Uh, we also designed two uh, AR interpreters, each for each of the countries, uh, a half-body interpreter, uh, that's the middle images on the side, so, um, and then the full body interpreter. They are both gender matched because we had uh, an English program in Britain and a German program in Germany, and we had a female and a male narrator, so you gender matched to the uh, narrator. Um, before we go on further, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to give this talk with a sort of idea of telling you things that I've not actually put in the paper because, you know, they're kind of uh, funny and not quite uh, scientific, but I kind of uh, think it. Um, when we were designing the AR interpreter, we got to play a bit of dress up. Um, now, this is an email that I think uh, I could send off to uh, my uh, signer. She was very instrumental on trying to figure out how to build a AR sign interpreter. Now, there are a lot of guidelines in the UK for how to build one for the broadcast uh, industry, but no one, no one has actually thought about how to do it if you are going to project it on a wall to the, uh, outside the TV. So essentially, I'm uh, telling her that, you know, uh, these are the colors that you, we have a cr chroma keying uh, a technology which uh, works with the blue color. If you have black hair, that's going to be an issue. Please don't wear white, uh, don't wear light blue, don't wear navy, don't wear jewelry, don't wear earrings. There's a lot of information that uh, we had to get across in a nice way, of course. Uh, but Dominique was, um, she was quite uh, instrumental, as I was saying, and uh, she was happy to uh, ask questions and come back and say, you know, do you, would you like me to buy a couple of outfits and come along? And so we had to have a dressing area, and she was, she was set in. We had a little bit of a mannequin play dress-up kind of thing to see the right uh, sort of outfits uh, she, she could wear. I don't think the guys in IRT had this issue. I think they just, so you just, so they had, had a, a green screen, has, um, has shown his image, um, and, you, you know, he just didn't have to wear green. He also doesn't have to tie his hair up or no jewelry problems. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a thing. Um, so I just wanted to show a little bit of um, the conditions themselves. Uh, it's essentially the similar setup in Germany. So this is the um, view of the traditional envision through the HoloLens. Participants were not wearing the HoloLens while they were looking at the traditional uh, envision, but this is not an image I can put on a paper, so I thought I'll uh, put it up here. Um, this is the half-body interpreter in close-up. Um, as you can see, she's sort of uh, near life-size and kind of fills in from the top of the TV frame to the bottom of the TV frame. And if you're looking at, looking at it through the HoloLens, then she's sitting on the, um, on the TV stand. Doesn't look like it on this image, but take my word for it. Um, and then this is a full uh, body interpreter. She is grounded on the floor, and she goes all the way to the uh, top of the TV frame. Um, so this is a video that we have. As you can see, it's very similar to traditional signing. Uh, there's a resting face where she's looking at the um, television as if she's watching it with you. And then when she starts interpreting, she starts uh, talking to the viewer. Um, and I love her. I mean, this is my favorite uh, condition, I think. She looks very much as if she's there. I mean, I don't use sign language on a regular basis, but the minute I saw this, I was thinking, surely this is going to be the best uh, condition out of all three. Um, and then this is the... Um, oh, sorry. That video doesn't play automatically because, you know... Anyway, so this is the uh, half-body interpreter. And... Um, She's also quite larger than life, and she's quite there, but uh, cut off. Um, the full design of the interpreters are available on a work in progress paper from TVX last year. But this is a summary of the guidelines that we use. The heads of the AR interpreters are aligned to the top of the TV. The bottom edge of the half-body AR interpreter is aligned with the bottom of the TV frame, almost sitting on the TV stand. The feet of the full-body AR interpreter is grounded to the floor of the physical room. Uh, the direction of gaze of the AR interpreter has to be horizontally facing towards the TV while in resting phase and has to be directly facing towards the viewer during the interpreting phase. And position to the right just outside the TV frame with a very slight overlap over the TV in order to minimize distance between the TV, uh, the content of the TV and the AR interpreter. And these were all guidelines that we took after talking with uh, our pilot uh, candidates and also the sign language interpreters themselves. Um, and then we designed the study. The study itself, again, was mirrored in both the UK and Germany, so 
Um, they, we had um, a training phase initially. You can't, we don't have the weather program that we used, but we had a weather program where participants could sit with us and talk about the AR technology. They could whinge about how heavy the uh, HoloLens device was. They could talk about how they had to keep the, uh, their body quite straight, essentially get their frustrations about the technology out of the way. We really wanted to focus on the design of the interpreters and not on the limitations of the technology. Uh, so we had a training phase where they could kind of get used to the whole um, uh, whole aspect of it. And it took a little bit of time, longer than we would with, uh, um, a, with people who are more used to the technology, but I think this was an important phase. The programs matched the languages of the country. So, you know, we had English and uh, British Sign Language um, in the UK, BSL, and German with Deutsches uh, DGS in uh, German. I cannot pronounce it, but Christopher over there will be able to do it. I'm just going to go and call it the German Sign Language. The gender of the interpreter was matched to the narrator, and each participant who came to us uh, saw three clips. Um, it was a, the clips were themselves on a continuous storyline, so that, that was the first clip, that was always the second clip, and that was always the third clips. But the sign language interpreters themselves were randomized, so people could, for instance, see the traditional followed by the half body, followed by the full body, or then traditional followed by the full body and half body and all the other permutations. But the storyline was kept intact. Um, there we go. Our participants all had hearing impl uh, impairments, uh, and they were all regular TV watchers about more than an hour a day. Uh, they had no biases against uh, factual documentaries, and they didn't hate public service broadcasters. I'm not sure about Germany, but in, in, well, in the UK, there are folks who hate the BBC. I don't know who these folks are, and I don't know why, but they're there. So we asked for people who did not particularly have that uh, feeling against us. Um, the folks that uh, the folks who did uh, we invited in the end uh, stated that they had a preference for subtitles because it was uh, perceived as more accurate, um, and they used it to improve their uh, written language skills. Uh, but they did think the sign content was the signing made it more. Uh, it was a more comprehensive thing because you had a lot of emotions and things like that which were not uh, captured in subtitles. Um, and this was especially the case if the participant only had a basic command of the um, written language. You have to understand that sign language is a language in itself, and it's the first language for many of the folks in the, in the community. All the participants understood the sign language, um, and unsurprisingly, participants mentioned that they could only lip-read on TV if the subject was facing outward, has been facing them. Um, all participants also reported they were expert level they, level of familiarity with computers, but only one of them in each country ha called themselves an AR expert. This is essentially the uh, demographic information that we have. It's nearly sort of uh, gender balanced. Uh, we have quite an older sort of range of uh, folks who came to us. And the folks also had different ways of describing themselves. So the profoundly deaf hearing impairments, hard of hearing, all those are key terms that they used to essentially tell us what their particular uh, impairments were. Um, we also have collected information about how proficient or fluent or basic, uh, how, how much, uh, whether it was a first language or a main language, and all those sort of uh, situation, extra details, all in the paper, so uh, please have a look. We then had some post-condition questionnaires. After each of the condition in the three conditions, we had questionnaires to ask them what they thought of that particular condition. And we also had a post-study question here at the very end to compare in between conditions. And we had an interview. But the interviews was more in, um, conducted in uh, parallel to the interviews, the post-study questionnaire interviews. So uh, whereas we would have essentially got folks to sit down and do a questionnaire uh, by themselves under normal conditions. For this particular study, we chose to help them along. So uh, we would sit down there and conduct the interview and get their um, responses uh, in person and type it all up. Um, we had some findings of mild interest. Again, it's in you know the uh, in the uh, paper, but in the UK. The responses on you know, whether they liked it was split three ways. Um, participants were kind of, for, for the questionnaire data. And in Germany, it was sort of split uh, nearly halfway with preferences for uh, the traditional winning out with then the half body and one person said they liked the full body AR. Um, the more interesting findings came in the qualitative uh, information that we gleaned. So 
novelty factors. We always had factors that they wanted to improve on. I've always wanted, so for instance, participants always um, had opinions on what, or expectations of what, the, what they call a hologram would be. So I've always wanted to watch a hologram and there has to be something in which a hologram just happens. Something like a projection, rather than something you have to put on. So there's already an idea of what um, uh, the technology should be uh, capable of. Um, they would like to get things like view closest to the videos. Um, there was also a question of cost and barriers to adopting the technology. If you had cochlear aids, that was an issue. So these are all factors that we, ha we hadn't taken into account and uh, we should in future studies. Physical discomfort. Having glasses on your head for two hours, no way. And I can imagine you put them on and everyone will look at you and they will recognize you're deaf. I don't like showing the outside world that I'm deaf. I feel too vulnerable. So there are also these personal feelings, very human feelings or uh, problems that you have to consider when uh, working uh, with this particular community. Um, for a longer film, holograms are unsuitable since the eyes got tired fast. In this case, subtitles are better. Maybe in the future, holograms could be displayed without hololenses or other glasses. Um, might be difficult for women with wonderful hairstyles. I am also wondering about people who wear distant glasses. Can those glasses, fashionably bigger ones, uh, fit into the HoloLens, like Dame Edna, for instance? We did not have Dame Edna, but, you know, this was, these are all very human problems that came across. Um, position of the interpreter. Uh, they liked the fact that the traditional, in the traditional method, the picture in picture was closer to the actual content, um, even though they were impressed with the HoloLens. So things like, you know, with traditional method, you can see everything with a new eye line. You have to move attention from one to the other in the HoloLens, so the distance was a bit of a problem. Conditions like a game of tennis. I wanted the signer on the picture, even if, if it obscured the picture itself. Um, I think the full body interpreter is better. However, it would be worth trying to place the interpreter half body over the TV because you will not be so left or right heavy. Same to do with the clarity of the interpreter. Position and opacity of the signer needs to be controlled by the user to make a huge difference. If I could move the signer and if I can change the luminosity of the signer, make it darker, same with subtitles, different size, different colors. So it went on with um, essentially people telling us that they wanted control over the way they had signers. Um, in terms with uh, traditional and AR, for instance, folks wanted to be sure that they could figure out where to put their place, uh, which signer to use, which signer to, uh, where to place them, and whether they could add subtitles in AR as well. Um, so, final discussions. Having control over where to place a signer would be good. People have different preferences and it would be good to adjust to type of program, people's visual capability, and wallpaper. I don't have time to make adjustments uh, to such a system and fine-tune things. There should be something universal. So what came out very clearly was that personalization is key because the preferences are quite individual. Some folks like the emotional type of interpreters. The other folks, they want more information. Um, so again, all of these are in the paper, and I think I'm running out of time quite quickly there, so I'm going to stop and... Uh, show you this. But we are, we do have more pieces of work that will be published in due course, including production guidelines and things like that. Thank you. I don't think we have time for study, uh, for any questions, right? <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, in this case, I would invite you to talk to Vino after the, uh, you know, after the session. So, thanks, Vino. Thank you.